Hi everyone, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and I'm here at the American College of Cardiology meeting, and I'm really pleased to be with one of my friends, uh, Rachel Lampert, who's a professor of medicine in electrophysiology at Yale University, and she's here to present the Live HCM study. It's a late-breaking uh, study, and it's uh, dealing with patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and whether they can do vigor vigorous exercise. It's a prospective study and really interesting findings. And Rachel, thanks for being with us. So John, I'm so pleased to be here presenting, uh, presenting the findings from the Live HCM or Lifestyle and Exercise in HCM study. You know, for decades, these patients have been restricted, not just from competitive sports, but even from vigorous exercise. And we know that many of them from, uh, then just sit on the couch and don't do anything. And so uh, what we did in this study um, was enroll, uh, we found individuals with, with HCM ages eight to 60, and we enrolled people across the spectrum of exercise. So we enrolled individuals who were vigorous exercisers, even competitive, doing moderate amounts of exercise to those who were sedentary and really had less active lifestyles. We followed them prospectively for three years, and we asked them every six months to uh, fill out a, a brief survey, just letting us know if they had had any of the uh, uh, endpoint events, which included a resuscitated cardiac arrest, uh, if they had a defibrillator, had they had an appropriate shock for ventricular arrhythmias, or if not, had they had a, a syncopal event felt potentially arrhythmic. And then, of course, we also uh, identified those who had died and, and total mortality was another part of the composite endpoint. So uh, we then compared the uh, vigorous exercisers to those exercising less vigorously, the moderate and sedated groups combined. And the findings. So, yeah, so we were so pleased to find that, um, based, that the vigorous exercisers did not have a higher rate of uh, the composite endpoint than the moderate and sedentary. Overall, the event rate was low. Less than 5% had one of the, across the board, had an event over the three years of follow-up. This translated when we looked at, uh, you know, per, per thousand patient years, it was 15.3 uh, events per thousand patient years in the uh, in the moderate and sedentary versus 15.9 in the vigorous. That gives us a hazard ratio of 1.01, really pretty darn close to unity. Um, we looked at uh, some, sub, some subgroups uh, of the, those who were more competitive amongst the vigorous. Um, we looked at uh, those who had only uh, a overt HCM. This study did enroll patients who had, um, uh, who had uh, genetic variants for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy without yet having expressed the disease. That accounted for 8%. Um, when we looked at the group without those, though, we, we basically had the same finding. The confidence intervals were a bit wider because it was a smaller group, but hazard ratio very similar. We've both been doing this for a while, and, and yeah. the, the teaching has been that patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, these th sort of thick, proarrhythmic ventricles, it's, it's hazardous for them to exercise, and you, you, you didn't, the, the, the data didn't bear this out. Yeah, I, mean, I think that we and the, the, the community of physicians that cares for these patients should feel reassured by these data. Um, we're hoping that these will form uh, the basis for now informed decision making between physicians and their uh, patients and families and really all involved in their care around levels of exercise. One um, point I'd like to bring out is that uh, the majority of our patients were followed um, in high volume HCM centers. They had been risk assessed by a knowledgeable HCM expert. Um, and so uh, it's really whether these data can be extrapolated to other environments, I think is unclear, um, it's, or should they say unknown. Um, it, it's really important for patients with HCM to see experts in the field who can really help them think about their disease overall, as well as this, this decision about exercise and sports. Well, you've published a lot about exercise and athletes, and as a person who really loves to do endurance <laughs> exercise, I'm, I'm sort of drawn to that. And it would be very difficult if someone told me you, you, you can't, you can't go, go on your bike, John. It would be terrible. <laughs> yeah. So how did you like, what's the genesis of this? And how did you get interested in this, this field and idea? So my interest in, in athletes who have cardiac disease really started with two patients that I had very early on in my, in my career as an attending um, who had different diseases, had gotten defibrillators. And uh, then, you know, the guidelines at the time said, no way, no how, you're done, which I expressed to these patients. Um, who, one of them, um, a, a, young, uh, a young adult, said to me, well, what's the data? And I said to him, well, you know, we don't have any, but that's what everyone thinks. And he says, well, I'm going to keep exercising until I see one, some data one way or the other. 
And so that really was the impetus for my first study, which was called the ICD Sports Registry. That was really a big series of individuals uh, who had gotten ICDs and continued to participate in competitive sports. And what that study showed, again, it was just uh, it was just a series. It wasn't a comparative group, but there were no adverse events. Nobody died. Nobody required resusc uh, external resuscitation. Nobody uh, injured themselves due to, to arrhythmias uh, or shocks. Um, and so, and a number of those patients had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So where that left us was, well, it looks like if you have HCM in a defibrillator, you're safe to be more vigorous. But if you are lower risk and don't have a need a defibrillator, then you're still restricted, which really didn't make sense to me or to, to patients. And so we really said, you know, we really need to figure this out for HCM in general so that we can advise our patients who are lower risk, you know, whether they can participate as well in vigorous exercise. Vigorous exercise. I mean, what are we talking? Some of these people, like... I know some of these people and they go at it really hard and um, uh, it, it seems like with a thick hypertrophic ventricle, it would, would be hazardous. So how, how do you explain this and, and give us an idea of like, would, are you surprised about these findings? Well, so I think there are hypothetical reasons why exercise could be dangerous and hypothetical reasons why it could be safe. So in thinking about just sort of the basic physiology of HCM and exercise, um, there could be uh, deleterious effects in the sense of if you have a thick enough ventricle, are you getting subendocardial ischemia when you exercise? On the other hand, we know that exercise is great for diastolic dysfunction, which or diastolic function, which is one of the problems in HCM. We know from a prior study done by Dr. Charlene Day called Reset that individuals can work out and can get themselves into better shape without adverse events as well. So there were hypothetical, oh, and the other, the other piece to think about, and this is a, it's sort of a complicated concept, but there's a paradox of exercise in the general population where we know that even in fit individuals, that exercise is, can be an immediate trigger. But we also know in the general population that exercise overall lowers your mortality. So how can those two things both be true? Well, the reason is that regular exercise changes your what we call sympathovagal balance or the amount of adrenaline running around in your body becomes less when you're physically fit and the more physically fit you are the better your sympathovagal balance like lower balance. heart rate with exercise yeah lower yeah. heart rate is one Resting way of, heart rate. yeah lower heart rate is one of the ways we measure sympathovagal right. balance and so that that may be protective so you kind of they, they kind of balance each other out and so i think um, i'm not surprised based on the physiology of exercise and what we know about exercise in general that in fact we ended up um, without a signal for harm yeah and let me ask you also about the the methods because you know it seems to me that you couldn't really study this in a randomized controlled way right this seems to me like the only way to do this is with a prospective observational study. Yeah. Uh, what do you say to that? Do you agree? Yes. And I think that's an excellent point. You really, you can randomize people, like you can take sedentary people and randomize them to short-term exercise or not, but really look at, you know, vigorous exercise, competitive exercise, long-term effects. I think it would be really next to impossible to randomize, uh, to do that kind of thing as a randomized trial. And in fact, even the data that we have on exercise in the general population generally comes from large epidemiological studies. Um, you know, so of course, with any observational trial, you have to be pretty careful. Are the groups equally matched? Um, and we did control for the um, uh, for the known. There, there were small differences in some of the known risk factors for sudden death between the groups, um, and we did control for those and without seeing a change. Okay, and then how did so, you how did you decide? I'm kind of interested in what's vigorous and what's uh, not vigorous? So we looked at a couple groups here. Our, our pre-specified you know, sort of categorization classification used a standard definition of vigorous, um, which was participating in an activity greater than six METs. So METs, as you know, are ways of sort of looking at the uh, metabolic uh, demand of exercise. So six METs, like swimming, ice hockey, things like that, running um, are, are over six METs. So uh, we defined uh, exercising at greater than or equal to six METs at least 60 hours per year, which is sort of a standard definition. Now, we also looked at those who um, des described themselves as uh, self-identified self as, as competitive. And we, for that initial analysis, we've looked at really any level of competition, whether they're you know, running marathons or in the, in the you know, tennis league at the club, um, also didn't see difference there. We do have some, um, a smaller but um, their group of uh, highest level athletes, varsity, um, you know, varsity high school and college, 
we have uh, 56 of those, um, 42 of, ho of whom have over HCM. And we'll be reporting on those uh, uh, a little bit later, but we can say at this point, we did not see a signal for harm in that highest level group either, although it's small. How, how does that work where if you have a documented like phenotypic HCM and your competitive athlete, um, how do they get permission? I'm just well, that, curious. That is a great question, John. So basically, um, it used to be that decisions about sports were made in a, a very paternalistic manner. We had the initial um, types of guidelines were like, yes or no, you have this, you're in, you have that, you're out. And you know what anybody thought about it or if there any sort of nuances of, of risk being unknown, what have you, were really not part of that decision. Even since uh, uh, 2015, uh, when the most recent AHA eligib eligibility uh, guidelines came out, um, there's been a move towards uh, sh shared decision making, whereas the physicians talking to the patient, we talk about what is the risk. Do we are you know how much of this risk is actually known? Are we dealing with unknown risks? If there are data, you know how do these apply to you, the patient in front of you, and really talk to patients about risk tolerance um, as opposed to like you're in, you're out. Now, even when the guidelines were so black and white schools uh, and leagues and what have you always have differed in their, uh, their comfort level with risk tolerance. And so even when it was a, a more uh, uh, hi uh, historically paternalistic approach, there were always schools that did allow uh, some of these people to participate. That's how we were able to do the ICD sports registry, because I even see. though it was against the guidelines, some schools were willing to take that sort of shared decision-making approach even, even before. Okay. And I, I, we have a few minutes left, and I, I want to get back to this, um, this, this paradox of exercise thing. This, this is interesting in that, in that the exercise itself can be hazardous because it can be a, like an adrenaline rush or whatever. But in general, in general, it's, it's beneficial because yes. of the, all the ch sort of changes that happen. Uh, the long-term you, you, physiological sympathetic changes. Sympathetic yeah. but also aren't there changes to the ventricle and eccentric re remodeling and all of that business that might be beneficial for... Well, those could all be hypothesized as well. Yep. As, as a reason yep. why this comes out this way. Yeah. I'm going to go back and we have a 40-year-old uh, woman or male uh, who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They've been evaluated by the electrophysiologist and, and by an expert and they say they don't require an ICD. What can we say? You know, I think what we can say at this time is that we now have data. Again, what sport do they want to do? Did we say what sport let's they want say, to do? Let's say they want to, uh, let's say they want to run 5Ks or 10Ks or they want to do these group rides on their bike or something like that. You know, so I think what we can say is we now have data that suggests that these activities do not put them at higher risk. And in fact, it, you know, if they're doing them regularly, they, you know, probably a good thing. Excellent. Rachel, yeah. thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks so much for your interest in the study, John. It's uh, always great to have these conversations. Great.